We have you loud and clear. Okay. That is great. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher, will be recognized for a quick question. This is Congressman Dana Rohrbacher, and uh, I appreciate this opportunity to ask you a direct question. And uh, I don't, I'm sure you, well, you may have seen the movie, but Sandra Bullock just had a movie called Gravity, and it dealt with the, uh, with the whole idea of space debris. And I was wondering if you might be able to uh, give us an understanding of the challenge of space debris, how the space station deals with it, uh, and if there are some other challenges like that that we may not be thinking about here that we have to deal with before we build a new station in space in the years ahead. It's a good question, Congressman. Yes, we do have to worry about space debris up here. As a matter of fact, a couple of nights ago, we had to do a, a debris avoidance maneuver uh, when we uh, realized that there was going to be a piece of debris close to our path. So we, uh, luckily, Mission Control has a good program set up. So when they see that, they go ahead and execute it. And within a few hours, we're out of way, uh, out of harm's way. And uh, we have people on the ground who monitor that for us, and they know where everything is as for where the debris is and where we are, and they can track at and keep us safe. The gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Johnson, uh, ranking member of this committee, is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and greetings to Commander Wiseman and Dr. Swanson. Uh, it's a lot of excitement on this end watching you. I would like both of you to comment on the aspects of the International Space Station program that is most important in enabling human uh, space exploration beyond the uh, Earth orbit. Oh, I don't want to take your entire day up. I could talk about this subject forever. Um, really, it's, it's getting humans into low Earth orbit and having us live up here uh, right now for six months at a time. And in just a little over a year, we'll have Scott Kelly up here for an entire year. And it's, it's all the things that happen to the human body and also what our spacecraft needs to provide to us, like oxygen, uh, to, to breathe water to drink, all of the food, the supplies, and just running this machine through its paces over six months or even a year at a, at a time, that's what we're going to need when we go onward to Mars and spend two or three years uh, in space. So we need to test all this stuff now on the space station so that in a decade or so we can head on to Mars and have a successful journey. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall, is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for linking our committee to these two astronauts, uh, Commander Wiseman and Dr. Swanson. I remember the House floor debate on June 23, 1993, in this committee, in this room, uh, when this committee came within one vote of killing the space station that Congressman Markey had fought for forever. Our argument made on behalf of the space station was the importance of providing something tangible that our children can dream about and then aim their education, their careers towards. So I'll just ask a simple question. How do you think the space station has inspired young people and can give us some examples of efforts on the space station to engage young people and inspire them to pursue STEM education? What would you say to be the space station's greatest legacy? I yield back. Oh, I do agree with you tremendously uh, about the STEM program. Uh, matter of fact, uh, one of the things I did before I got here was work on spheres with students in the local high school. And that's what we do, an experiment we have up here. And the kids themselves get to program the spheres, satellites that, that float around here, and they have competitions. And I just saw it on the kids' faces when they got to have their program run on the station. They got so enthused about science and technology. It was fantastic. The gentlewoman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards, is recognized. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you so much. I have to tell you, I am so excited. I wish I could be you when I grow up. Uh, my, my question and greetings to Reed Weissman, a fellow Marylander. Um, you know, we'll package some freeze-dried crab cakes for you up there. Uh, I wonder if you could, uh, if you could tell us. <laughs> I got that signal. I wonder if I wonder if you could tell us, though, uh, the importance of the work that you do and how you were inspired to join the space program. What inspired you? Because I think it is really a challenge for us to figure out 
what ex inspires the next generation of explorers? That's a great question. And I think back to my childhood, and certainly it was when the space shuttle was just being developed and launched back in 1981. I was uh, around six years old at the time, and I definitely remember uh, a 747 flying over Maryland, and I was at, in Towson with my parents. We had gone up to the top of a hill for the simple act of watching a space shuttle fly over on the back of a 747 as they were transporting it. And that image is burned into my mind. Uh, and that probably started the course that I, I was on to become uh, not only a Navy pilot, test pilot, and then an astronaut. So to me, we never know as, uh, as adults, we never know that little thing that's going to spark the imagination of a child's mind. And for me, it was a simple airplane with a space shuttle flying. All right, that's not simple, but it was that simple act of being with my parents, and that's what sparked my imagination. And so uh, as much as we can from up here and NASA on the ground to reach out to, to kids and just expose them to this world, this STEM world that's in motion, I think you never know when you're going to spark their imagination, and I'm sure that we're doing it every day. The gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Palazzo, is recognized. Hey, Reed and Steve, thanks for talking to us today. Um, hopefully the chairman of the full committee will allow us to have a congressional trip to the space station in the near future. Uh, I have a question for you from one of my constituents in South Mississippi. Uh, Suzanne would like to know, how do you deal with the incredible solitude for the length of your respective missions? That is an interesting question. Um, each person probably does it a little differently. One of the things we like to do, I think, that helps uh, keep us calm and motivated at the same time is look out the window on our beautiful planet. Uh, when we have free time, we, we always go over to this window we have called a cupola. It's basically like the glass bottom boat of, this, of our ship, and we look down on Earth, and it's fantastic. And that's what keeps us going, I think, just looking at our beautiful planet. The gentleman from California, Mr. Peters, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and hello, gentlemen. I had a question for you uh, for our committee. Uh, we struggle a, long t uh, a lot with um, how to maintain the country's lead in science. I wondered if you could give us your perspective on how important space uh, exploration and research is to maintaining our nation's lead in science. Well, certainly, it's, uh, it's right at the cutting edge. And, and this is just one of our many uh, pieces, I guess, in our overall uh, U.S. portfolio of leading this technological revolution that we're living day to day. And so, uh, I don't know, right here, just, just off our screen to the right, it, there's the arm of Robonaut. And Robonaut is hanging out. Uh, we just had him out last night to do, uh, to do some upgrades, and we'll bring it out and uh, get it in full operation here, maybe even with a set of legs. Uh, down the road. So the work we're doing up here is right on the cutting edge, but that's just one small piece across our entire country of what's going on. And a lot of it is thanks to uh, government funding and pumping money into this research that's critical for our nation, not just five years down the road, but 50 and 100 years down the road to stay on the cutting edge. The gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Brooks, is recognized. Dr. Swanson, uh, Commander Weissman, hi, I'm Mo Brooks from Alabama's 5th District, the home of the Marshall Space Flight Center. As a child, uh, I grew up feeling the ground shake as a Saturn V rocket was tested nearby. And I vividly remember Apollo 11 when Neil Armstrong descended from the lunar module declaring one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The Apollo program was American exceptionalism at its best. It made us all proud to be Americans. My question is, what mission should America's space program next embark on to be the next giant leap for mankind? <laughs> yes, I believe on a, we should get ourselves to Mars. I know it's a difficult road ahead to get there, but I believe we can do it. And this is a, one of the first blocks that we have to do is learn how to live in space and recycle everything we need to from water, air, everything we need to do, bring, grow our own food, all that kind of stuff so we can reduce the amount of supplies with us, uh, create a robust system. And right here we're starting it off. We probably have to do a few other steps before we get there, but I think going to Mars is our main goal. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Ms. Clark, is recognized. 
Thank you. It is great to be here. I have some questions from the Compass Summer Program students in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They submitted over 40 questions, so I will be quick. <laughs> from Dante, how do you pack? Do you bring a suitcase and what is the temperature? From Chloe, what fuel do you use to, um, to support the space shuttle? And from Luke, has anyone had a birthday? And if so, how did you celebrate? Okay, so uh, we pack in a very, very small suitcase. It's about that big. We get about one and a half kilograms. Um, the fuel that we use, well, for our rocket ship, we basically use kerosene and oxygen to get up here. And then once we're on the space station, we have a hypergolic fuel mix that we use to keep us here, but we don't have to burn our engines very often. And then we did have a Russian crewmate who had a birthday. And right behind the camera, we have a dinner table there uh, in node one. And we all gather around that table, all six of us. And uh, we share uh, US food, European food, Russian food, uh, some of our juices, uh, some of the Russian teas are very nice. And uh, we just join together and have a really, a really great evening. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think there were any presents to unwrap. But uh, Sasha, yeah, I, I think uh, he was happy enough. So it was a great, great event. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, is recognized. Uh, Dr. Swanson and Commander Wiseman, uh, sometimes it's hard for Americans to understand why human space exploration is so important. Uh, can you take a moment to explain how the work you're doing now on the International Space Station benefits Americans? What are you up to? I think there are a few different ways to look at that question. One, we are doing research right now. Uh, on our scientific aspect, we do from uh, burning new ways to learn how actual fire works uh, in the details part of it. We do medical research up here. We've just, uh, through station research, we've come up with ways to get chemotherapy to the target areas of the body more effectively. Uh, just one of a, an example. The other thing you have a look at is, is that humans are meant to explore, I believe, and this is one path that we need to take. And now we're starting off it, and this uh, fulfills that idea, I think, for our, just, not, just the whole race of humans. And that's one thing we need to do. And the other aspect, I believe this is a really good investment. Uh, a lot of spin-off technologies come out of this. It creates uh, economy, uh, sorry, it's good for the economy. It creates money for our country, uh, and it creates a better world for all of us. The gentleman from Washington, Mr. Kilmer, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being with us. Um, uh, I have uh, two quick questions that came from the young gentleman behind me uh, here. Uh, uh, one is just trying to get a sense uh, more of, uh, of how the space station plays into um, the effort to, to go to Mars, and uh, a little bit more specific about uh, what, what the utility is of the space station. Then he also wants to know, um, uh, as we look out into uh, this century, uh, w what's what's on the horizon? What what other new frontiers do do you think we're going to to visit? And he also wants to know how many other planets are we going to discover? Is that right? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> well, let, let's start All with right. the let's start with the end question: How many planets? Limitless. Mm -hmm. It just depends on how how good our sensors get in our lifetimes as to how many we're going to discover. Uh, perhaps every time you look up at night at any star, you got to think there's a solar system around that star. So uh, it just blows my mind. I know. Um, for the space station and how does this play into our long duration missions? If we're going to go to Mars, we're going to set out on a three plus year journey. And if you have one major system break without spares on that journey, and that could be your own human body, your heart, your muscles, your bones, that could be your environmental control system, that could be your engines, your solar arrays, any piece of that puzzle falls apart and now you've lost your, your mission to Mars. So this is the test bed, this is where we start the, the fundamental blocking and tackling of, of this challenge to get to Mars. And, and I think that research is being done right now, and we're seeing very successful results. Uh, our water balance is almost at 90 percent, so we recycle our urine into drinking water. We recycle uh, water into oxygen. We have a really amazing regenerative system up here, and it's proving extremely effective, and we're working on reliability. That's another step in, in, that, uh, in that quest. And I hope that covers enough of your <laughs> questions, sir. <laughs> the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Stockman. 
Thank you for uh, having this broadcast today. As, as you are my constituents, I appreciate what you are doing. I am also proud of our country and our support of you. But some of you uh, in, may know that up here it is not universal support, which I think is a mistake. And what would you, if you were me, what would you tell my colleagues why they should be supportive of uh, your efforts and why uh, we should vote three times the amount of money that we're supporting right now? Or four times, I don't care. <laughs> uh, I would be happy with twice, but that's a good question. Um, that's a really good question, really, because again, it goes back to what do we provide for our, the taxpayer? And I do think we one we provide research and development. Uh, that's what we get out of this. We get uh, new products, new ideas, new science, new research, which always helps the country in the future, maybe 10, 15 years down the road. And again, that creates new companies, which does again goes better for the economy. We get that we inspire the new generation, which hopefully gets them to be productive and help out and make our country stronger. And we then are explorers, which again help the whole human race. I would try to go with those points. The gentleman from California, Mr. Swalwell. Hello, and my questions today come from the Bay Area, and I have three young aspiring astronauts uh, with questions, uh, Shea Daly of San Ramon, uh, Phoebe Bruns of Castro Valley, uh, and Julia Warren uh, of Castro Valley. And the first question is an easy one uh, for Commander Wiseman, and that is, what is your favorite food in space? And also for uh, Dr. Swanson, uh, the question is, do you think one day we will encounter life uh, from another planet? You go first. Okay, I, I am uh, I am a food lover, and uh, but there is one particular food that they know when they open the desserts box. Uh, all chocolate pudding cake goes directly to Reed Wiseman's uh, locker, <laughs> and so I am hoarding chocolate pudding cake. I cannot get enough of this stuff. I tried it on Earth, and I didn't really like it that much. But there's something about this cake up here that I uh, I'm in love with. So I'll pass it over to Dr. Swanson for the follow-on. For the follow-on question, I have to say yes. I mean, that's just such uh, endless, as, as Reed pointed out, uh, as you look up, there's so many solar systems out there, so many planets, so many possibilities. I figure that it just has to be somewhere and some, sometime it will happen. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schweikert, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and a Texan on my staff wants me to say howdy. Um, in your experience so far, what have you found that has surprised you on what's robust, um, has held up quite well on the space station, and what have you found that is fragile that you see we're going to have to do future reengineering of? Yeah. Uh, so I would lead that off, uh, sir, with. Yeah. This is my first space flight, and I've known the space station uh, for many, many years. Uh, we're into our 5,000-plus day of ops up here, and one of the first things that struck me when I arrived is I expected to see an aging system. I expected uh, it to be, well, I don't know, from the TV, maybe it does look messy to you, but every one of these wires has a purpose. And when I got up here, I realized this is a brilliant laboratory. It's in overall amazing shape. It's been very well cared for, and I think it's basically a testament to the engineering that went in, the robustness of the design, that here we've been operating 5,000 days, and this thing really looks like a brand new machine up here. Uh, very impressive to me from, from that aspect. Some things that aren't quite as reliable, the things that have surprised me a little bit is, you really get to see how quickly technology on Earth develops when you come up here. This was developed in the 80s and 90s, and, uh, and really, you do see Ethernet cables running all around the outside because we didn't necessarily have that technology when they built it. Uh, we just flew up some tablets. And I mean, there's a device that, that a year ago I hardly even knew, and now at home I can barely live without. And so just building on these technologies as we go over time has been somewhat of a surprise. You can kind of see the evolution of technology up here. And so that's something in future designs, I don't even know how you account for that, but it's something we'll have to look at. The gentlewoman from Connecticut, Ms. Esty, is recognized probably for the last question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The students of Waterbury, Connecticut, home of Rick Mastracchio, want to know what they can best do to become astronauts of the future. Well, of course, it always goes with study hard. Uh, you have to do well in school. That's a, that's a given. And also, it's find something that you're really passionate about in life. 
Uh, of course, it helps if it's science and technology or engineering to get this job. But you find an area in there that you're passionate about, do it well, uh, enjoy it, and that will show when you go and try to become an astronaut. And that's what they're really looking for, somebody who's passionate about the things they do. Unfortunately, we are out of time. The astronauts are out of time. We want to thank you both for spending uh, 20 minutes with us today. Appreciate all your answers to the questions. We look forward to supporting you in the future. We'll talk again. Thank you all very much.